So we're here talking about, um, about why we're called to do good works. To, um, to kind of set the stage for this discussion, I, I think I want to make sure we, we all agree on two principles. Uh, the first is this, that Jesus sets the bar for how we should act. He, he established what we are supposed to do, how we are supposed to work in this world. And uh, we find this in the Sermon on the Mount. And he sets the bar really high. Chapter 5 of Matthew. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus takes the law. We found out a couple of weeks ago, was it 633? Joe, where's Joe? How many? 13. Oh, it's Darla. Okay, I'm sorry. It's 13. All right. All right. No, it's yes, she is. <laughs> See, I, we do that a lot. I, I show my ignorance and she shows her knowledge. Uh, Jesus here is taking the law and says, well, that's nice. But he takes it up here. And, and let's face it. Who can do this? Who can meet that standard? By the way, women do not get a hall pass here. It works the same way. Okay? Okay? And then he takes it up another notch. You have heard that, that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Who can meet that standard? We can't do it. We can't do it. It's impossible. And I think Jesus is making this point. So, we're toast, right? I mean, that's, but that's, that's rule. That, that, that's, that's, that's the uh, number, the worst thing I wanted to establish is we can't meet the standard to earn our way to salvation, to earn our way to heaven. So are we toast? No, of course not. What we have is the promise of God's love. We have the promise of God's grace. Now, where do we find that? Well, frankly, I think it's most per persuasively found in how God has acted to reveal God's love of all humanity. We see it with the very, in Genesis 1, the act of creation is nothing other than an act of love. The best I ever heard it said was, was a preacher one time said, God said, this, this being, this existence is too good not to share. And so God created the world. God created us. An act of pure love. And then the, the next of the three big examples is the incarnation. The incarnation of God in the form of Christ. And then finally, of course, the crucifixion and resurrection and return of Jesus to us. Those are acts of pure love. But some people want Scripture. So I'll give you a little Scripture, okay? From Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. From Luke. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. This is, this is Jesus talking. And then from Matthew. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asked for bread, would give a stone? Or if the child asked for a fish, would give a snake? If you then, who are evil, 
know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? From Matthew. So we can take these two, we can take these two doctrines, if you will, these two positions and say this. A, we can't earn our way to salvation. But B, God offers grace and forgiveness to each and every one of us. We're in. We're in. We're in. We don't have to worry about it. At a Bible study earlier this week, as we were talking, one of the people spoke up and, and was talking about the disciples and how the disciples went from this bumbling group of misfits and um, cowards, pre-resurrection to post-resurrection, these, these, these amazing people who were willing to give their life for the faith. And somebody spoke up and said, I would like to be like the disciples, but I don't know that I can be that good, and it concerns me. We don't have to be concerned. We don't have to be concerned. We have God's grace. So we put those two together, and the question becomes this. Why bother? Why bother? I bother with being good. I mean, maybe every once in a while. But, but, but why? Why, try, why, why, why love our neighbor? Why do all these things for others? Why bother? We don't need to, do we? The answer is no, we don't. We don't. But there is a theological imperative for us. And let's, let's see if we can work our way to get to that. And by the way, so what's the first, what's the first thing that comes to my, my, came to my mind? Why well, bother with this? Well, I guess the first, uh, first thing we might say is fire insurance. In other words, the thinking goes kind of like this. What if I'm wrong? <laughs> what, what if I do need to do all these good works? What, what if grace is not extended to, every, to serve everybody? What if there's a cutoff? And I, I need to get past that cutoff. Where's the cutoff? I don't know. I just need to get past it. Fire insurance. I want to, I want, I want, I'm a little concerned. I hate you, Randy, but I'm a little concerned. Well, we don't need to worry about this. Folks, the whole story of the Bible can be summed up, if you want to, in this word. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, Adam and Eve messed it up. Nevertheless, God forgave them. Abraham and Adam, Abraham and God entered into a covenant. God says, I'm going to give you all these descendants more numerous than the stars and the sands on the beach. And then Sarah and Abraham, they go and decide they're going to take things in their own hand. And Abraham has a, has a son by, a con by, his, by, by the slave woman, Hagar. Breaks the covenant. Thumbs his nose at God, and God says, nevertheless, and keeps God's promise. And the same thing with Jacob, and the same thing with Joseph, and the same thing with the prophets, the same thing with the kings, with David. David and Bathsheba, not, a, not David's finest hour. Nevertheless, God blesses Israel. Nevertheless, nevertheless, until finally we've mucked it all up. And God comes in the form of Jesus. Nevertheless, God loves us. And if you want, if you, if you want some scripture for that, we can look at Luke 23. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death by him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Hanging on the cross, looking down at everybody who had put him on that cross, God the Son forgave them. 
There's nothing that we can do that God will not forgive. So, we don't need the fire insurance. That's not a theological imperative for good works. All right. How about this? Good old-fashioned obedience to our superior. All right. Face it. Okay, Jesus tells us over and over to do good works. We got the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho gets waylaid on the path, on the, on the road, beaten, left for dead. First, a priest sees him and goes to the other side and goes along his way. Then a Levite sees him and goes along the other way. And then a Samaritan who hate Jews. Jews hate Samaritans. He rescues this man and cares for him. And we're told to do likewise. We're told to do good work. So, hey, we're supposed to obey our superiors. We're supposed to obey God and Jesus. Good. Okay, that's good. It's good. It's a good reason. But is it a theological imperative? I mean, if we are obeying for the sake of obedience only, this is the point. If we're th- obeying for the sake of obedience only, well, it's really nothing different than a dressed up version of fire insurance, is it? Think about it this way. So often, children, especially teenagers, especially teenagers, will obey their parents simply for the sake of obeying them. And they do so for two reasons, either to get, get something or to avoid something. <laughs> to get the keys to the car for the weekend or to avoid being grounded. So, obeying these, these, these commandments to do good, if you will, just for the sake of obedience is no more than being that teenager. It's, it's doing it to curry some favor or doing it to avoid something. It takes us right back to fire insurance. How about, how about as a is a transactional kind of thing. This is getting a little esoteric, but and it's, it's, it kind of goes something like this. You know, if I, if I do good things, people around me, then they may be uh, inclined to do good things for, for others as well, do good things for me. And if, uh, if enough people join in, then it makes the world a little bit better or makes at least my little world here a little easier to, uh, to enjoy, a little more palatable, a little more pleasant place to live. That's kind of a selfish motive, really, isn't it? You're, you're doing good, hoping you'll get good in return. So that's really not a theological imperative. How about ethics? How about an ethical imperative? It's simply the right thing to do. And this holds a lot of attraction, and it's admirable. And it's the reasoning behind so many of our atheist and agnostic friends. It's the right thing to do. And so many of our agnostic and atheist friends, you know, volunteer volunteer their time, volunteer their talents to others in need. And there's nothing wrong with this. And frankly, it's good. I applaud them for it. But it does nothing for our inquiry about a theological imperative to do good works. So that brings us to love. Love, specifically the natural response of being in a relationship of love with God. I touched on this in my sermon on All Saints Day. I'm sure everybody remembers it. (laughs) Maybe you remember the story of me talking about how I uh, don't particularly enjoy emptying the dishwasher, but I, I do it. And I do it because I love Darwin. And 
natural response of love is to do things that are pleasing to the beloved. Let me give you another example. And I say, I tell you about the dishwasher, and I'm going to tell you this example, not to pat myself on the shoulder. They're not a, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. It's, it's an example of what we all do with respect to those whom we love. In, on Christmas Day 2017, right? 2017? I... Yeah. Darling Morgan and I were in a, well, my daughter Morgan was in a movie theater and I was parking the car and it was icy outside. And anyway, Darla slipped and fell on some substance in the theater and broke her kneecap in two. Yeah. Oh. It was a big deal. It was a really big deal. She had surgery a week later. We lived on a, in a uh, townhouse, a three-story townhouse. The bedrooms were on the third floor. <laughs> All the bedrooms. The second floor was the kitchen and, the, uh, and, and, and a little dining area and a little living room. And the, the bottom floor was a, a little den, a little den, a little hallway, the garage, and Sydney. Sydney was our dog. And her Darla couldn't get up and down those stairs. So she has a surgery. And she, Darla, for six weeks or maybe eight weeks, was confined to that room downstairs. She had to sleep there. She couldn't get upstairs. And uh, so I, I got into this habit. Darla and I like coffee in the morning. I got in this habit as I was headed out to seminary, leaving Sydney and Darla. Uh, I would make her coffee. And after a lot of trial and error, I finally got, to, got where I could fix it right with the right amount of cream and the right amount of sweetener. And I would leave it as I left. I'd leave it beside her. And she got to the point where she could um, move upstairs. And I just kept taking that coffee to her. I liked doing it. And then we moved to Mississippi. And I kept taking that coffee to her and leaving it on the table. Then we moved here and I started working out. I, I, I used to work out in, in Birmingham five and 5.30 in the morning. I got back in that routine. So now I leave, I leave the coffee by our for the bedside every day. Some days I hear, oh, thank you. Some days I don't, <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, Dolly can get up and fix coffee. It's not that hard. And we make a joke about it when I'm out of town or she's out there and she'll say, oh, I had to fix my coffee today. It's not that big a deal, is it? But I love doing it. And, and if she, every once in a while, she'll beat me up. No, no, that's, that came out wrong. <laughs> well, that, that too, but every once in a while, she'll get up before I do. And then when I realize that, I run to the, I run to the kitchen to fix her coffee because it's a way that I say I love you. It's just something, it's not a chore. It's, it gives me joy to do something, however small it is, for her. <clears throat> There's an analogy here in a relationship with God. When, uh, when Darl and I were in Birmingham, and we first joined the Episcopal Church, the, the, the pastor there, the, the rector there, through a series of circumstances, the death of his daughter primarily, had developed a theme to his ministry. And that theme was, life is gift. And when I was called, when, when Darl and I were called to go to seminary, to go into ministry, I would wonder from time to time, would there ever develop a theme in my ministry? And interestingly, now that I'm about to retire, over the past several months, I realized one has developed, and it's this. And if nobody hears me say, remembers anything I, else I say from my years at Nativity, I'd like you to remember this one thing. Faith is not a belief system. Christian faith is not a mental operation. Christian faith is not a thought process. Christian faith 
is a relationship of love with God. Hey. And in any loving relationship, it is a two-way street. Um, and, and think about this for a second. God, God has demonstrated so many ways how God loves us. Uh, we went through those earlier. What, what can we do to demonstrate our love of God? Because, and, and, how, and, and what, is there anything else we can do? When you think about it, there's nothing we own, nothing we have, nothing we can have that we can give to God, God created it, right? Uh, God can make us do anything. But there's one exception to both those statements, and that's love. God can make us do anything except love God. God can create anything but except our love for God. God has given us the capacity to, but it's the only thing that we can withhold from God or give to God. That is the only thing. And that's all that God wants from us is love. And we reference that every Sunday in our Eucharistic prayer. I wonder if this phrase has ever struck you as odd. From prayer A, we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you. From prayer B, we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. What does that mean? A sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Well, it's really, that's just another way of saying a sacrifice of love because that's the only thing that we can choose to give or withhold from God is our praise and thanksgiving, our love. Now, here's the deal. We can't, I don't know about you, but I can't simply say one day, I'm going to love God. I choose right now to love God. I mean, we can say it. We can make a choice to embark on that path, but it is a path. Just like the, the, um, the, the point where Darla and I are. We didn't simply decide this one day. It's come, it's come about after 38 years. It's something that requires time, care, nurturing, and intentionality requires study, prayer, quiet time, silence in God's presence. But, and I'm bringing back in my coffee story. When we get to that point where we begin to fall in love with God, when we begin to reciprocate God's love, because it's already, it's already coming this way. That's when this obedience, that's when these good works don't become, are no longer a chore. They're a joy. Just like getting the coffee. It's a joy for me. So doing these good works, the theological imperative is it is the natural outflow of reciprocating God's love with our own, with sacrificing our praise and thanksgiving, with giving that back to God. Indeed. It takes time. It's not hard. It's, it's really not hard. I mean, prayer is not hard. Reading scripture is not hard. Sitting in silence with God, being in God's presence is not hard. But it takes intentionality and it takes time. Terry, you. But here's the cool thing. 
what we get back in return is priceless. If you've probably noticed by now that I end every service with a blessing that begins with the peace of God which passes all understanding. That comes from Philippians. By the way, it, it is the blessing that is in the prayer book in right one. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. But the key phrase is the peace that passes all understanding. That. What that? That is the gift of being in love with God. And once you taste it, once you experience, you never want to be without it. That's why I sign all my letters and all my emails, God's peace. The peace that passes all understanding. And so, that I think is the theological imperative for good works. It's just what comes out. It's the, out, it's the overflow. It's the outflowing of that relationship of love with God. It simply is natural. And it's joyful. And I'll leave you with this. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be among us and remain with us forever. Amen. Amen.